Hi and welcome back to Hacker 101. This is the second in a series of three videos on the basics of mobile application testing. In the last session, we talked about the types of mobile apps, some general methodology, and other key tips. If you haven't seen that yet, go check it out before you continue with this video. In this session, we're going to talk about some essential Android tools, setting things up for testing, and some key tips to be effective. Let's first talk about the structure of an Android application. There are a bunch of different parts, but we're only going to talk about the most relevant ones here. Google's documentation is great if you want to get a more holistic view of Android. The top level piece is the APK format, which is really just a zip file with some additional signature stuff inside of it. For our purposes, that part isn't relevant. We care about the application code, which comes in the form of DEX files, the resources, and other critical components like that. You can unzip this like any other zip file, but if you need to look into resources, I suggest instead using APK tool to unpack it. That will decode the binary resource files and such into a human readable format. I'll talk more about APK tool in a bit. DEX files are the actual compiled Java or Kotlin code for an Android app. Specifically, they contain bytecode for the Dalvik virtual machine, and later, Android runtime. You can disassemble these DEX files to a format called Smalley, which APK Tool will do automatically. This can then be patched by hand and reassembled, again using APK Tool. This can be done manually with Box Smalley and Smalley tools directly, but I personally only ever do it via APK Tool. However, if you're not aiming to patch code but just gain an understanding of what it's doing, your best bet is to decompile the Java. We'll talk about the process for doing that a bit later in the session. The manifest, androidmanifest.xml, is where a lot of the critical information for an Android app is stored. Permissions, activities, intents, and more all get defined and referenced here. APK tool also decodes this to a human readable format for you as it's stored in a binary format in the APK. Finally, let's talk resources. An Android app contains a ton of different resources from strings to images to layout XML. While images rarely expose anything interesting, the others often do. If you look through the layouts and you see one that includes admin, debug, or development functionality, this may be a tip-off that you can either get into this via the application or find the equivalent functions on the backend server. Strings can also tip you off in the very same way. Now let's cover some tools that I consider essential for effective testing. You don't strictly need all of these, often they're composed of a bunch of separate tools that you could use separately, like APK Tool or Android Studio, but I couldn't imagine getting through a large app without all of these. The first tool to discuss is Android Studio. This is the official environment in which most Android apps are developed. This is super handy for taking snippets of decompiled code and embedding them in small test applications, so you can actually see what they do in that limited context. A bit more importantly, though, is the fact that Android Studio contains the official Android emulator. You can create virtual Android devices of any shape, size, OS, and CPU architecture within Android Studio, specifically in the AVD, Android Virtual Device Manager. You can choose what functionality is available on the device and then let it go, where it acts just like any other Android device. Once a device is running, you can just drag an APK onto the window and drop it to install or you can use the ADB command line tool to do this manually. One thing to note is that the CPU architecture of your virtual device really matters. x86 based devices will be able to run using virtualization on most systems, which means greatly increased performance and smoother interactions. ARM on the other hand is the same architecture used by most phones and tablets, so some applications will only work there, but it is much slower x86 should always be your first choice, as the difference is truly night and day. But do bear in mind that some applications just won't work here. As an alternative to the default Android emulator, Gen Emotion is much nicer to use and is often faster in my experience. One downside is that it's commercially focused, but the licenses are fairly affordable. Additionally, there is a free version if you just want to try it out. This is definitely optional though, and you can get by just fine with the Android emulator that comes with Android Studio. APK Tool is the most useful tool in the entire Android app hacking arsenal. This will unpack an APK, decode all binary resources to human readable versions, disassemble the DEX files, and much more. 
It can also be used to do the reverse, allowing you to unpack an application, make some change, and repack it into a usable app. A great example for when you might want to do this is where an application on the client side is checking permissions and stopping you from completing an action. You can unpack with APK tool, patch out the check in the assembly, then use APK tool to rebuild and sign the app. Next up is Dex to Jar. This is a pretty simple tool, allowing conversion of APK or Dex files to standard Java Jar files. Given that the reverse of this, Jar to Dex, is how Android apps are typically compiled, this works quite well. It's not perfect, but I've found it to be very successful for my Android app hacking. Also, if you're interested in compilers like I am, spend some time thinking about how this must work, given that Dalvik bytecode is register-based and Java bytecode is stack-based. There are some really interesting challenges, and dex to jar handles them well. JD GUI is a fantastic decompiler for Java bytecode, which makes it ideal for decompiling the output of dex to jar There are situations where it will fail and fall back to showing Java bytecode, but I found these to be really rare in my experience. We'll talk later about how I use these tools together. Finally, we come to Frida. This is a system for runtime instrumentation of code, which essentially means that you can write scripts to manipulate and inspect running applications. The full scope of what can be done with Frida could fill a multi-hundred page book, but some common tasks are to watch file I.O., inspect network connections, and disable certificate pinning. The Frida site has a lot of great resources to learn more, and the community at large has released thousands of useful scripts. Now that we've covered tools, let's talk about setting up Burp for Android hacking. If you haven't used Burp before, definitely check out our video series on the subject, which covers beginner level to master level Burp usage. To set up the proxy on the Android emulator, start a device and click the dot 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 button, then click the settings tab on the extended controls window, and proxy settings are there. After this convoluted process to get here, the actual settings are easy. Just set the host to localhost and the port to whatever burp is listening on. For physical devices, things are a bit different. Go into the Wi-Fi settings, long press on the network you're connected to, click Modify Network, and then you're able to set proxy settings here. Before you actually set this, make sure burp is listening on all interfaces, or at least listening on your Ethernet or wireless interface. Otherwise, your device won't be able to connect to the proxy at all. Once you've validated that, just point the device's proxy settings at your proxy computer's internal IP and the port Burp is listening on. Finally, if this is a device with cellular data service, I recommend disabling that while you're testing. You're likely to run into issues if you don't. Now that your proxy is set up, whichever route you needed to use, you need to install the CA certificate, or applications won't be able to negotiate SSL connections with the proxy. With the proxy enabled, go to http colon slash slash burp in a browser. In the top right corner of the page, you'll have a link to download your burp installation's unique CA certificate. Click this and download the file. Go to Android settings, click the security and location option, then encryption and credentials, then install from SD card. You'll be able to select the certificate file here. Congratulations, you should have everything HTTP and HTTPS running through Burp. Warning though, there are a few caveats to the everything part. Specifically, some applications may make direct network requests, which bypass your proxy entirely, and some applications make use of certificate pinning. For the direct network request side of things, it's possible to make use of the VPN functionality in Android to connect to your computer and proxy that way. We'll include a link on the Hacker 101 website for dealing with this case if it does come up. As for certificate pinning, this is where an application validates that the server certificate is a known good one, or belongs to a known good entity. In this case, you'll have to jump through a bit of hoops to get your proxy working properly. We'll talk about that a bit later. Next, let's talk a little bit about rooting. If you're not familiar, this is a process where you get super user access, meaning you'll be able to do more or less anything you want on your device. For instance, you can look at or tamper with any file, make changes to system level configuration that's ordinarily hidden from users, and install Frida at the system level. Rooting isn't necessary for virtual Android devices, but it may be required for your testing on physical ones. Before we get into the how, a huge warning is in order. Never root a device that contains critical information or accounts. 
rooting a device drastically reduces its overall security posture. This warning is doubly true for a device that's used with work accounts. This is a good way to get very angry calls from your IT staff. The rule I'd suggest is only root a device if you'd be willing to unlock it and hand it over to a stranger. I wish I could give more specific information on how to root a given device, but this is highly device specific. For some, like the Google Nexus or Pixel devices, it's as simple as running a few commands. For others, it requires using an exploit to unlock and root your device. If you simply Google for device model root instructions, you'll pretty quickly find the resources required. A word of warning though, for some of the harder devices to unlock, you may find yourself on sketchy websites to get the information you need. Be mindful of anything you download and run from those sites. Now onto something that's a little bit more fun. Let's talk decompilation. This is the process by which we take compiled code, in this case Java or Kotlin code usually, and attempt to get back source that functions like the original. You'll never get back the exact same code, but it'll generally be equivalent in function. The process here is fairly straightforward, only really consisting of two pieces. Once you've installed dex to jar and JD GUI, run dex to jar f path to the APK on the command line, and you'll get a file called original name dash dex to jar dot jar. You can then just open this in JD GUI, and you'll be presented with a simple little interface to browse through the Java classes. My recommendation though is to not actually read the code in JD GUI. This is a bit cumbersome and the interface is really limited. Rather, I suggest using the save all sources function in the file menu, which will spit out a nicely structured Java code base to the path you specify. Then you can open it in an editor of your choosing. With some manual work and combining the output of that with the output of APK tool, you can often get a buildable version of the project in Android Studio. With that, you'd be able to make any changes you wish. For instance, to add extra logging or test various bugs. Finally, let's talk about some testing tips for Android apps. Think of these as an augment to the methodology suggestions in the first session of this series. These tips alone won't lead you to a successful test. After you install Android Studio in the Android SDK, you'll get a tool called ADB, which is the Android Debug Bridge. Basically, this allows you to install and uninstall apps, push or pull files, and most importantly for this scenario, see the system logs. Running ADB Logcat will give you the whole log, which includes both system messages and application specific ones. You can also filter this list, clear the log, and more. Check out the documentation for the ADB Logcat tool to see the complete list of flags, because there are a ton of useful features available. As mentioned before, if your target application fails to connect once you've enabled a proxy, but HTTPS websites work in the browser, it's very likely that certificate pinning is to blame. We've added a reference on the Hacker101 site that includes four different approaches to defeat certificate pinning. These range from fairly straightforward, replacing a file in an APK, to the complex, patching custom validation code out of an application. This is a deeply application-specific problem, and it's one of those things that you'll pick up as you do it more and more. And lastly, let's talk about intent filters. Android intents are operations to be performed by the application, like dialing a phone number or viewing a specific page. Intent filters allow an app to register as a handler for a specific URL or protocol scheme. Because of this, any website could redirect to one of those matched URLs and open the intent to which it's registered. Normally this is great, but if the intent code isn't built to validate input properly, vulnerabilities with a really simple exploit path can be introduced. Intent filters are registered in the manifest file we talked about earlier, but to get a good view of the whole system, you really need to take a look at both the manifest and the code that handles the intent. A hacker disclosed a fantastic report that shows the complete path to discovering a fun cross-site scripting bug in the IRC Cloud application from discovery in the manifest to a working exploit. Definitely check that report out. Congratulations, you now have a good understanding of how to get started with Android app hacking. There's plenty more to learn, but these first steps are critical. 
If you haven't done so already, please consider giving the video a like and subscribing to our channel for more content. As always, thanks for watching and happy breaking.